Why are women at a higher risk during car crashes? In part one of this lecture, we looked at whether this is due to a gender data gap, which is supposedly caused by a widespread omission of female crash test devices. We noticed that a majority of claims which point in this direction are either completely unfounded or at least intentionally put in a subjective light in order to promote a questionable narrative. If you haven't watched part one, then definitely check it out in the video description to find out why there really is no gender data gap in crash safety. But since the risk of men and women are different in crashes, there also have to be circumstances that cause this disparity. Hi, my name is Sid, this is Crashworthy, and today we are looking into injury risk factors of female car occupants. The vast majority of authors refer to one or more of the following three significant studies on gender-specific risks. These go by the catchy titles that I have listed for you here. As all other resources, they are also linked for you in the description. Two studies were published by the University of Virginia, one in 2011 and one in 2019, and one other study was published by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in 2013. Of course, every journalist supplements the following hard data points with additional information or interviews to make their story come alive. But here are the core pieces of information which are usually selected from these three studies. Given comparable crashes, women are between 47 and 71% more likely to be injured. Depending on the type of injury and type of crash, these numbers vary. Usually, an average added risk of 50% is stated. While chest injuries are 38% more likely, spine injuries are even 67% more likely for women. Also, they are 17% more likely to die in similar crashes. This gap is often described to be linked to vehicles design and technology, which in my opinion is an incorrect simplification of what the study actually says. Here's the original statement made by the NHTSA. The increased risk for older occupants and women may to a large extent be a consequence of intrinsic human anatomy and physiology, but a vehicle's design and technology and the crash environment could also be influential. Considering only severe injuries, women seem to be at an added risk of 73%. The greatest differences in injury occurrence is found in the lower extremities of the body. Now these numbers are the result of well-founded research. And as that's the case, these studies also give very strong indications to what the cause of these gender disparities are. But before we get into that, I want to make a point of giving you an idea just how selective the aforementioned facts are. While these are all true, here's a second story that can be told from these exact same studies just by quoting different findings that are usually left out. Vehicles have become much safer for everyone, regardless of gender, age, size and weight. From 1955 to 2002, the fatality risk has dropped by 42%. For model year 2009 and newer vehicles, the reduction of severe injury probability is even greater, 55%. In absolute numbers, men are three times more likely to be involved in a fatal crash than women. Given an equally severe crash, the added fatality risk for women has diminished to half or even less of its original value between 1990 and 2011. Protection technologies leading up to the study in 2013 have benefited all age groups, as well as men and women. None of them were harmful to any specific group. Seatbelts and driver seats are even more effective for women than for men. Airbags also seem to be more advantageous for women than for men. Women are less likely to suffer a skull fracture or severe brain injury in a frontal crash by 53 or 56% respectively. Women are more fragile than men in young ages. However, this rapidly starts to change after age 35. By their 60s, men are equally or even more at risk to die in a crash than women. As you can tell, this is a very different story than the one from before. It is absolutely not my goal to downplay the added risk that women still face in crashes today. But I do want to make sure that you understand that authorities and engineers have been hard at work to improve safety and that they have already diminished risk disparities by large amounts. Looking at these facts, especially the absolute fatality risk, I hope you will share the sentiment that there is no reason to panic about car crashes, even if you are a woman. All this aside, what are the origins of female added risk? Let's revisit the NHTSA summary. The increased risk for older occupants in women may to a large extent be a consequence of intrinsic human anatomy and physiology, but a vehicle's design and technology and the crash environment could also be influential. This clearly states the main factor at play here, the different physiology of men and women. Digging deeper into the studies, you will notice that at less severe levels, women are more susceptible to arm and leg injuries, 
and at more severe levels to leg, pelvis and especially neck injuries. This is consistent with the following three facts. Firstly, the average woman is smaller than the average man and therefore has to sit closer to the steering wheel and to the dashboard. This leaves a lot less room for restraint systems to slow down the body before it impacts the dashboard with both arms and legs. This has been acknowledged years ago and is addressed by knee airbags and soft dashboards, which also get checked for, for example by Euro NCAP, by means of a so-called knee mapping evaluation. While this has proven to be effective in decreasing harm to passengers' legs, this also bears one problem. The missing room between a small driver's knee and the dashboard just can't be offset simply by cushioning the impact area, since this will also benefit a knee coming in from a further distance. Therefore, measures in this area largely benefit the absolute risk of injury, but rarely the relative risk between men and women. The second physiological fact is that women have wider pelvises than men. Simple mechanics dictates that this makes women's pelvises more fragile to forces that are exerted on it through their legs. Legs which are already burdened with higher forces from impacting the dashboard from a closer distance due to the forward seating position. These two constraints make it impossible to obtain an equal risk for male and female pelvises at the same impact speed. Now, we would have the ability to decrease the impact speed by lowering the speed limits on our roads. But again, this would in turn make these impacts less harmful to everyone, not just female occupants, and therefore would not close the risk disparity. This pretty much leaves us without further options, except for introducing speed limits that are adjusted for the driver's size. The third physiological fact is that women have less muscle mass than men. This is very noticeable in the much higher incidence of neck injuries for women. While being restrained by a safety belt, the neck experiences high forces due to the initially continued forward motion of the head. These forces can partially be absorbed by neck and shoulder muscles before they start to cause injuries to the upper spine. Due to women's weaker muscle structure, the absorbed forces are much lower and therefore neck injuries are more common. As we discussed earlier, airbags seem to benefit women a lot more than men. We can now see the reason for this. One of the main advantages of airbags is that they support the head during its forward motion and therefore limit the head movement relative to the upper body. This lessens the strain on the neck and greatly benefits women who have much more trouble sustaining forces on their necks. These three facts explain what NHTSA meant when they listed human physiology, vehicle design and technology as an explanation. The last influential aspect was named crash environment. As already stated by the University of Virginia in 2011, women are 15% less likely to drive light trucks and 13% more likely to drive passenger vehicles. At the same time, bigger vehicles, such as SUVs, are 20% less likely to have an injured driver after a crash compared to a passenger car. The same rationale has also been found by IHS. The Insurance Institute found two main reasons for women's higher risk, which can be condensed as follows. Firstly, women tend to drive smaller and lighter vehicles. This bears an increased risk in accidents, since the lighter vehicle will experience greater acceleration during a collision and will therefore put higher strain on its occupants. Secondly, women tend to drive less aggressive than men and therefore usually do not drive the impacting vehicle in a crash, but rather the vehicle that is being impacted. When comparing different collision types, you can hope for the best protection level if you experience a frontal collision. Side, rear end and rollover accidents are usually more harmful than front crashes. When you cause an accident, it is very likely that you do it by frontally colliding with someone. The other vehicle, however, is just as likely to be impacted on the side or rear end. Therefore, statistically, the impacted vehicle is at a disadvantage and therefore women are at a disadvantage. At this point, I want to stress again that everything we talked about can be found within the three studies by University of Virginia and NHTSA. Beyond that, the main finding that women's bodies are simply more easily injured is a widely accepted fact in other research fields, such as sports. The notion of minimizing disparities is by all means a great idea. To achieve this, however, we must first accept that there are natural differences in injury susceptibility and refrain from blaming authorities and manufacturers simply because they are the easiest target. Forcing even more female dummies onto safety developers is not the solution. Instead, we should focus on refining the current test devices. This would benefit all occupants and would make it possible to tailor vehicle safety even more to the special needs of female bodies. Closing natural disparities is a noble endeavor, but only if it does not disabuse us from our goal to minimize the total number of road casualties, be it male or female. Please do not hesitate to do some research on your own before you promote an idea. Adopting someone else's narrative is rarely a good idea without confirming that the story checks out. 
For you to be able to do that, I always put all the used resources in the video description, so please be my guest and check out the three studies and see for yourself. Subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like this, and until next time, stay curious.